I'm happy to be here and especially to have this invited talk on this Friday morning, the third day of the Eidler conference, because um, now I see many familiar faces here uh, after these few days. And uh, that's, that's really, really nice because now I have an overview of what you are doing. I, I saw your posters, some of your presentations. So it's really very good to be here. Um, yes, and I thank you for being here. Um, after the wonderful dinner um, of yesterday night that you found your way back. It's incredible. I had, had some difficulties myself, actually, but I came here uh, and I'm very happy now to, uh, to be able to talk to you. Um, yes, um, um, we, we didn't have an anniversary yesterday. I don't know, I don't think many of you realized, but uh, uh, Laurie just mentioned the uh, famous or infamous GDPR. Uh, yesterday, the GDPR uh, was in effect for five years, actually, um, and uh, we never know if it's a cause for celebration or not. <laughs> um, I think it really helps us in making things transparent, and I'm sure we as researchers can make the best of the GDPR and not see it as our enemy. Um, the GDPR is really meant for commercial parties just throwing around all these personal data um, and not meant against um, uh, research institutes, but it does have impact. And the impact, I think we should really try to implement in the most positive way for our uh, participants in our research and for sharing their data. And then I think it can only help us. But we have to acknowledge as well that it takes extra work to comply with all these uh, requirements. Okay. So you see here my, my talk, it's about sensitive data, um, about Claren, it's about a case center for atypical communication expertise, which is abbreviated as ACE, uh, to have a kind of tennis uh, association, so to speak. Um, uh, and then the, the, what I will tell you about is, in, in fact, quite logically following from this first of an intro to Clarin, then to this ACE Knowledge Center, then a specific um, initiative in which I'm involved for pathological speech data, which is called DELAD. And then I hope to have some time for addressing two use cases so that you can see um, how this in fact is implemented in reality. Um, and then I really hope there's time for questions as well. Um, I gave a workshop uh, uh, Wednesday morning with, uh, I see still some faces uh, there for, for, with the participants, and it was great to have all these questions because I learned from them a lot because you also have use cases that can be new to me and really make me think of, of how things can be improved for myself, but also for you. So <clears throat> let me start out with telling something about Claren, which is a common language um, uh, resources infrastructure in Europe and has a, a great uh, potential and also great coverage uh, these days. But it is, it, it is a, um, a consortium, so countries are members of, of Claren and they have to uh, be associated to that. But many countries already are, and Italy is one of the good examples. Um, um, let's hope we perhaps some more people will enter. Uh, I thought maybe uh, just telling first about Claren could be interpreted as a kind of commercial, uh, starting with the real stuff. Uh, but it's more than this. It's uh, it's really inform 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 infomercial, if you would like. But it is um, uh, relevant because also for me to sketch the framework where I'm working in. So it has this ERIC status, which is a, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, a very official one. But the thing is that it is really geared towards making accessible language resources and tools uh, and to allow researchers to work with these. Um, and to make things easy, they really put their uh, efforts in making a single uh, sign-on environment, which is sometimes uh, also detrimental, detrimental is not the, the right word, but if you do are not a partner, a member of Clarin, it can be hard to access these uh, services. Um, also directed to knowledge exchange, um, and uh, Clarin, Clarin is not working on itself, saying, okay, uh, we are the party everyone should turn to. Um, it's very good to 
turn to Clarin, but they have their connections with the European Open Science Cloud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, um, they are really outward looking and and looking for the networks that are relevant. Um, so we now have 22 members, three observers, um, some even outside uh, Europe, and there are also uh, 25 uh, certified data centers. Um, I will come back to the centers uh, uh, later. But you can see um, all these centers provide a lot of data. It's in a federated context. So it's not that Claren has one um, um, uh, storage place where everything is put. No, the members uh, which have the status of a data center, there is the data and they are made findable through the Claren Virtual Language Observatory, through the metadata, which are also harvested. So it's really a portal, and from there you go to the individual data centers. Um, and that, I think, is a very good setup, um, um, and it can also make it much more sustainable in the end. So there are all kinds of data we are talking about in Claren. It's newspaper archives, literary text, social media, um, parliamentary records. They also have working groups on specific types of data. So for parliamentary records, there's really the Parliament Initiative, where they try to make everything available in TEI format. Um, historical letters, we have oral history data. I hope to give an example of, in one of my use cases, uh, broadcast archives and so on. So um, for the oral uh, history um, um, resource family, I will give an, uh, an example, but there are much more um, and the link is below. I think the, the data, the, the slides will be shared uh, after the conference. So um, it will help you to click the links yourself. So. Claren is really reaching out and trying to connect different um, communities of use. And this is why they have all these um, uh, different data types of which they um, uh, um, try to advance for being shared. Um, and then there's a long list of, of, of data types, but also users that they have in their, in, in their um, objectives. Um, so, I have already told you that this virtual language observatory has a kind of key role in finding uh, data because it is there where every uh, metadata, uh, all metadata is, is coming together by way of harvesting and uh, in that way um, you can get access to the data. Um, but there's also the, 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 um, the link to the tools that you can have there. So, it's, it's not like perhaps, you know, ELRA or uh, the LDC providing language resources in terms of data only. No, Laren also wants to make the tools available in kinds of switchboards where you can easily pick your uh, uh, data analysis tools and work with them. So Claren is really open-minded, but also in, in, in strong favor of open science. Um, and I think this is one of the very interesting principles of, of, of Claren, um, um, because it, it adheres to the fair principles of data sharing, um, and that means open data sharing, but also in, 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 in the vein of what um, the fair principles are. It, it is really, you must make your data as open as possible, but as closed as needed. Right? It's not like everything should be freely available for everyone. No, you have to find the right access levels to make data available and be aware in cases where the data cannot be, be, not be made available. Um, okay, so that is important for that aspect. Um, then, um, I think it's important for you to know that if you want to share data and have an idea of under what kind of licenses you could do this, uh, Claren has a very helpful page where you can turn to um, showing the type of access levels that they have in their repertoire in terms of open and public. Uh, a bit, and then it's open for everyone. You can immediately download it or uh, a bit more restricted. So only downloadable for academic institutes, or then more restricted, where you really have to go to a process of um, uh, applying to have access to the resource uh, and being um, admitted to a download. So there are all kinds of different access levels there, which 
uh, Claren caters for. And to help you to find the proper license, they have a license wizard, or they call it a calculator. And uh, we've also used it in one of our projects. Sylvia knows uh, for the Hutsona archives. Uh, uh, she went through this whole uh, uh, calculator and came out with, I think, the most complicated license I've ever seen. Uh, but that's thorough work, and it also shows what is possible. And it's not like we only cater for very simple ones. Uh, no, you can really go into the depth there. <clears throat> so here's a couple of useful links if you want to know more uh, about Claren. Um, and then I think the next step is indeed the data center, the centers that uh, Claren provides. So we have the B centers, and these are the technical centers, um, and, and they are really the backbone of the data uh, pr provision. Um, so they uh, offer the, the access to the resources, the service, um, uh, and, and really provide the sustainable basis that, that we are really looking uh, to in, in terms of um, um, uh, looking to the future. Uh, and Claren is really headed for that. So then we have the C centers. They only provide metadata. Uh, they perhaps have their own data. That's not the, the, the thing. But um, in the Claren context, they can only uh, make metadata available to resources, which are then harvested and made visible in the virtual language observatory. But they do not offer any further services. And then we have the knowledge uh, centers who share the knowledge and expertise, being a help desk for specific um, um, types of uh, expertise that you may be looking for and for which you may require some assistance. Um, so these knowledge centers can go into all directions. Uh, they can be knowledge centers for specific languages. Uh, but they can also be knowledge centers for specific expertise, like um, a sign language or so. And sometimes you see overlapping stuff. So um, uh, we have a, um, uh, a knowledge center called ACE, and I will come back to that later. It will be next slide. Um, but we also work with sign languages. And then we see other knowledge centers, for example, in Greece or Sweden, also working with sign languages uh, in their uh, uh, respective uh, uh, sign languages for their country. Uh, and that enables ways to cooperate. Uh, so we, uh, in this um, uh, clan resource family for sign languages, which Lori just mentioned, um, we work together with all these other sign knowledge centers to make uh, this happen. So these knowledge centers are always also ways of meeting other knowledge centers and work together. So uh, we are then at, uh, in Nijmegen, at the Radboud University, having the knowledge center for atypical communication expertise. Uh, and this is the proof that we have a certificate, <laughs> which is um, at, the accreditation is, is for five years, so it's prolonged uh, after that. And you have to go through an exam after that to, uh, to, 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 to show that you have uh, taken uh, advantage of this position and used it to help others. Um, so um, this is uh, um, um, uh, something that I think is good because it really uh, makes you active. It's not something that you have and then can just uh, show uh, show off with, uh, but you have to prove it all, all the time. So uh, you have to make an, uh, an annual report and so on. So yeah, what we, do we call a typical uh, communication? Um, it's it's language acquisition and development. It's language disorders. It's also sign language, of course. Here is a gray area because the, the sign language as such is, is, is not an atypical in its own kind because that's normal uh, communication. Um, but it is, uh, say, uh, atypical in the sense for what the others consider normal. And I think it's really important to uh, promote that. And uh, um, we also, uh, when it comes to sign language or the deaf and hard of hearing um, uh, community, work in the ways that they if they do the, the, the oral communication, some of them do, for example, also after a cochlear implant, they have this atypical communication sometimes. This is certainly not true for all cognitive implant speakers, so to make sure. Um, but some of them um, uh, really have this atypical communication uh, form. So, um, and that uh, for for um, uh, speech disorders, we typically work together with this Daylight group, which I will will be part of my next uh, um, uh, topic. Okay. 
so this is a uh, more uh, information about the, the Claire Knowledge Center ACE. Uh, so we have a, a target audience direct towards linguists, psychologists, neuroscientists, computer scientists, speech and language therapists, and what we try to offer. Uh, not to forget the education specialist, by the way, um, because also we are working on language acquisition and how you can um, promote language acquisition through the use of um, uh, computer um, uh, support, for example, in, in um, services where you help people learning another language through automatic speech recognition as uh, services. Uh, automatic speech recognition is not only meant uh, and uh, suited for um, finding the right transcription of what is being said. It's also suited for finding pronunciation issues because if a word is not understood correctly, there's something wrong with the pronunciation and to really try to target which of the phonemes uh, cause the problems there. Um, and speech recognition can be really very useful uh, in, in that respect. Okay, so that's for the education. So what we offer um, is, is information and guidelines about hosting corporate data sets uh, for a typical communication um, and where you can find such uh, materials. Um, we uh, offer help desk a consist uh, consultancy for questions on these topics, some technical assistance if you might need that, uh, and of course dissemination of uh, uh, how relevant this uh, atypical kind of communication is. Uh, in, in workshops and contributions like this one. So where I I'm, I'm really uh, would like you to invite to look at the website uh, of, uh, of uh, this Knowledge Center ACE and, and see what can be in there for you. Um, I would like to highlight a couple of interesting things that we, we have uh, um, uh, achieved here. So in uh, this, um, as a Knowledge Center, helping to find the right places to store and share your data. We found a collaboration with the Language Archive of the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen, which is a Claren B Center. So they are able to host these, uh, and, and, and to host these uh, materials. Um, so where we will be a knowledge center directing to them when it comes to storing uh, your data in their repository um, they have all the access means in terms of what I was just telling uh, uh, in terms of open access or restricted access and the various levels that you can find in there. Um, and it is a very interesting thing that in this way, uh, this is a typical Nijmegen corporation, but you see immediately the national and international aspects of this because Claren again is international. So um, we have a short line to our colleagues uh, at, I think it's 500 meters far from our building, uh, but to work in an international context. Okay. Uh, another interesting collaboration that we have as a knowledge center is with the Talk Bank. Uh, the Talk Bank um, has, a, has an enormous um, um, uh, function as for researchers to find interesting resources, for, um, but it is, uh, of course, it is uh, in the in the USA. So um, the kind of cooperation that we now have uh, looked for and found is that an interesting data set can be made available uh, through the talk bank, through their uh, search facilities so that you can find it. Uh, and then the metadata is also provided through the talk bank so you can find it there. Um, but then there will be a link to the raw data which is stored on, say, European soil again. So we have noticed in our talks with researchers that they really do not feel comfortable when their data uh, is stored on, uh, say, uh, American soil but outside the EU. Um, but on the other hand, we want to take advantage of the status of the talk bank, for example. So then we are looking for ways to, to cooperate in that respect. And I think this is a very nice example of how we were able to do this um, and, and uh, make this work. So um, I will give an example in, in the other use case at the end of my talk, uh, how we dealt with a, a use case for Polish uh, deaf uh, children. Okay, so there is a, a, some publications which you might want to have a look at later. Um, and then, yeah, well, that's a bit new format here, but it is the, first to the third topic. Uh, it's, it's the DELAT initiative. 
Um, so uh, Dela is, is Swedish for shared, um, um, and I always forget what exactly the acronym is standing for, but um, it is uh, really meant to share data for um, uh, a pathological speech. We will call it uh, the, the, the acronym that we use is CSD, so Cooperative with uh, Speech Disorders. Um, uh, there are four, five subtopics here, which I will, uh, will briefly address. So first, uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, the DELIT initiative. Um, so the, the partners are a mix of researchers, infrastructure specialists, and legal experts, because this is what you have to bring together if you want to um, give access and share such very sensitive data as we are talking about now, uh, speech disorder data. Um, and to, to do this properly, you need a lot of expertise coming together. So we do this through organizing uh, annual workshops where we have these groups convene. Uh, typically, we have also uh, uh, people from uh, Clarence Legal um, uh, Committee, it's called CLIC, uh, helping us with the legal aspects of sharing such uh, data. Um, the topics addressed in such workshops uh, groups are indeed such legal aspects, but we also uh, invite researchers to present their corpora and to present their ideas of how they could be shared, but also the obstacles that they face in sharing, so that we have a discussion about this, what, how, how it could be amended, uh, and sometimes come to the conclusion that they, they do can't be shared, and uh, that, that, that is an outcome as well, because you know, um, for the GDPR, a very um, important uh, legal basis for sharing is consent. Uh, it's, it's hard to find any other way uh, apart from, from that. So um, if there's no consent, and especially for legacy data, uh, the consent is not appropriate for sharing it uh, outside or wider after the project ends and so on. Uh, then, then you do have a problem. Um, but still, then it depends on the type of data, uh, what can be done and cannot be done. Okay, this will be a, a topic, a subtopic for later on as well. Um, so we discuss uh, um, the layered access of data, which I told you is can we make it open, uh, restricted, etc. Levels of, of anonymization, because if you have data that can be anonymized, then all of a sudden the GDPR is not effective anymore, right? So the GDPR is not meant for anonymous data. Um, but of course, when we are talking out, uh, about uh, speech uh, pathologies, this is not always possible, but sometimes it is when you use transcripts uh, of, of some data, which are, are quite um, uh, narrow transcriptions and can't be referred to an individual again. So then again, you can make it uh, open, shareable. Okay, we talk about good uh, formats to make the data interoperable and the uh, relevant metadata that um, are needed for sharing such data. In fact, we now have plans to uh, set up a clear resource family for, uh, say, uh, uh, disordered uh, speech disorder data, uh, pathological speech data, because this will be a next step, I think, for Daylight to uh, introduce such a, such a resource family. So these are the goals then of Daylight. Uh, in, in short, provide this uh, GDPR compliant platform for digital archiving and sharing of disordered speech data for different levels of access um, and enhance the research and teaching through these uh, uh, resources, uh, support development and assessment of therapeutic, therapeutic practice. This was almost a typical, atypical speech as well. Networking and knowledge development through workshops and websites with information links. So we really try to reach out and uh, to reach out to the relevant uh, researchers helping them and learning from them. So one of the things that we have set up guidelines for is for annotation tools and techniques. Now, I don't have the time to go through all of these, you, you understand, but to give you a hint of what typical things are that we face when uh, annotating, transcribing, tools annotating, of course, uh, pathological speech. Um, let me give um, uh, some of these uh, um, 
um, issues which you should be able to address. It's the multi-layer annotation. You need it for many more purposes, but when it comes to pathological speech data, um, there are so many more things perhaps to include as well, to have visual representations of these uh, multi-layer annotations, time alignment, um, extensions to the international phonetic alphabet, um, and then typically for the atypical ways of pronunciation, uncertainty labeling. Uh, um, these you will see in other types of speech research as well, but they are typically relevant when it comes to the pathological uh, uh, speech. So here's an example um, where we uh, um, use Annotation Pro. Um, we give some uh, uh, references to uh, to the literature here, um, but here you see how you can deal with this time alignment at the multimodal annotation. So, um, and there's uh, the annotation in ELAM as well, which I think is well known by, by most of you as well, I guess. Uh, when it comes to the visualization and, and not being able to be, to make discrete categories showing uncertainty and overlaps, you can use these uh, color uh, stuff, um, which is also available in the Annotation Pro software tool. Um, so we think it's relevant to highlight for pathological speech uh, that, uh, that the tools should allow to combine manual and automatic ways of uh, uh, data processing. Um, being aware that this that you might need different software tools for this so they the tools should be able to communicate in terms of file formats that are uh, exchangeable and um, so we are also constantly looking for tools that allow this um, so there are tools um, that allow such conversions um, and and we do have examples for that okay um, other guidelines that the DELAT uh, initiative developed for pathological speech is for consent and uh, storage. Um, so, um, we see that um, there is a lot of information about research data management on websites of many universities and, and, and uh, other in, uh, funded initiatives. But the amount of details vary. Uh, the info is most generic, uh, so that it is applicable to various disciplines, but not directly to pathological uh, uh, areas. Um, so we have developed a page where we offer some guidelines for that. Um, it starts out with a few pointers to other useful websites, which you may have a look at and, and get oriented in. Then we present a case scenario um, supported by a discussion of key ethics issues, sample information sheets and consent forms, uh, things to address and to, uh, um, to attend to. So then we have a quite complicated uh, use case that we um, point out, but that's done in order to address several issues that, 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 that may pop out when you do this type of research. So in this case, we have a, a researcher uh, planning to carry a research project that investigates articulatory errors in adolescents and young adults with cerebral palsy using both our auditory, perceptual, and acoustic analyses. Um, and then there is uh, um, uh, this data and, and um, can we record it? So the data will be compared to that of a group of age, gender matched, typical speakers, so a control group, to find out if, what the differences are. Um, and then we have a screening uh, uh, ahead of that. So, and there will be a language test as well. Then the acoustic analysis will be carried out by the research assistants of the project, where a group of typical individuals will be recruited as the listeners of the auditory perceptual analysis of speech. Okay. Um, Yes, and then they also um, plan to have the speech data archived um, for possible further research um, to make it available for, for this research and for education purposes. So the 
scenario then captures common elements in many speech disorder research projects, key ethical issues, uh, and um, we give these guidelines uh, because these are the things that you should attend to when, when setting up such an experiment. But of course, working at the university, you always have to go back then to the local uh, authorities uh, to get things done. But this can already help you to be aware of what the relevant uh, issues are. So they refer to the involvement of human participants, collecting data from individuals under age 18, uh, vulnerable individuals, uh, personal information, uh, how is the research data then collected, um, uh, processed and shared, and what are the data access levels uh, that then come into a, a view, um, and to use them for secondary analysis. Then the third um, guidelines page on the DELAT website addresses uh, uh, so-called data protection um, impact assessment and role material which we developed uh, for this. Um, so we talk about the data protection impact assessment, DPA uh, in brief, which is um, required under GDPR um, uh, also to assess what you can do with data that is uh, uh, really risky in terms of uh, say data leakage, um, specifically when um, when the data is from vulnerable persons. Um, and so this is a, the DPA is a process designed to describe processing as a necessity and proportionality, help to manage the risks of the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So resulting from um, making the data collections and sharing them. Um, but it is really a kind of uh, also a risk assessment. So you make an inventory of what the possible risks are, the ways of um, uh, measures of uh, solving them, and then make a decision on yes or no, which the data can be shared or collected or whatever. So it is a process for building and demonstrating compliance with the GDPR. So this. Uh, Role play was developed by uh, one of our colleagues at, uh, in the Groningen University, um, and the, role, the, 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 the objective of the role play is to make the students experienced doing a multi-stakeholder assessment in a real research scenario. Each student will play a role of one of the stakeholders involved in the DPI proce process. And this will help the students to think of the relevant elements that uh, should come to mind when you're collecting this type of uh, sensitive data. But it will also help you to take the perspective of others to see, okay, you, um, when we have the perspective, the, the stakeholders here of, of the researchers, you have the data subjects or their representatives, you have the legal and um, um, know-how, you have the ethics board, you have the data uh, archive, um, and these are the most important uh, stakeholders there, and they should come together and find out how things can be managed and to do this uh, DPI. So the method is around the themes of confidentiality, integrity, transparency, protection goals as a center, unlinkability, intervenability, and availability of the data. And then the aims and the requirements are to protect the data from unauthorized uh, person uh, using them or getting access to them, transparency, uh, transparency of the whole process, uh, guaranteeing the rights of the participants, um, make sure that the data are not corrupted, Data shall be processed only for the purpose which they were collected, which is the minimization goal setting uh, principle of the GDPR. And data must be available during the process project and to authorized parties only. So then you can think of safety measures, so a secure authentication system, informed consent as the basis, documented discipline-specific good practices, the information for the data subjects um, uh, about their rights, um, 
when it comes to the intervenability that you have a single point of contact where people can turn to um, restriction of writing and modification permissions when it comes to the um, um, uh, soundness of the data. Um, unlinkability uh, measures like pseudonymization and anonymization and data backups for availability. So these are then things that can be discussed in such a role play, how to uh, implement such measures. So what we did, we had a role play in one of our workshops and then after that we made uh, Daylight the movie. So uh, starring all the people in the steering committee of, uh, of Daylight, um, uh, I've not been approached by Spielberg yet, but you know, <laughs> I have a second uh, career. Um, uh, so the material is available on our website. It's a trailer of the role play, a video, the role cards that you can use for the play, and the template for making a report. So we did a role play uh, Wednesday morning with a group of students. I think it is a nice uh, thing to do. Uh, it also allows you, you can do the real role play thing, but you can also play with it as a teacher. So Wednesday morning, I was playing the chair of such a committee, and the students, uh, playing each a part in the stakeholder, came up with their uh, risk assessment and then the ideas of how to amend these for using safety measures came from all of them because it's not like if you, uh, from your point of view, think of a risk of sharing data, it's not your task to also solve it. Of course, you could think about it, but the other party should also think about ways to solve it. So there things come together. And then at the end, you make a final assessment on, okay, can we collect the data or can we share these data or not? Um, yes, yeah, so this is um, uh, the, the use case that is uh, in, in the example that we have on the, on the page. I'm not going through this at all. Um, it is a bit long. Interesting for you to know that we presented the uh, material at a, an annual conference of Clarence, uh, uh, Clarence two years ago. Um, and uh, it's also used uh, uh, in other uh, uh, programs. So if it's interesting for your course, you, you should just uh, go to our page. And there's also an impact story about this, so you can read more about this. Um, and feel free to contact me if you would like me to help you with setting up such a role play. So, yes, then there's the walk through the Daylight uh, website. Um, I'm looking at the time. Um, the only thing I can say now is that you will find on the Daylight website these uh, guidelines for which I, I was talking about. Um, so, uh, in a more extensive way than I uh, was able to present today. So, then there are I would like to present you two use cases that because I think that's relevant for you to get an idea of what we are talking about. So one is for a resource family for oral history. So I wouldn't directly call this atypical speech, but it is an interesting example of uh, uh, sharing sensitive data. Um, so if we would go there, I hope we can go back then later. So this is uh, uh, on the Claren website. And, and there you have a, a subcategory on resource families, and this is then the oral history corpora. So we start with an introduction here on what oral history is and how you can um, deal with it, that we set up a, a metadata profile in the SIMD format and help uh, our researchers in filling such a profile if you would like to do this for your own oral history data. And then the first collection is the collection Bruzzone, uh, which was offered by uh, Sylvia and her colleagues. Um, and if you go further down, you see there are also other uh, examples of uh, voices, what we call voices from Ravensbrück. So um, female uh, prisoners in this uh, camp um, giving interviews about their um, um, uh, about the life there and after it. So there are a lot of instances providing this type of information, um, but I would like now to just highlight the Collection Ruzzone. You see the interesting thing here uh, where you say, okay, we have the type of annotation, the license, and this is the, the license wizard that came up with this uh, license, uh, you know, um, and then 
you can get extra information here um, by clicking. Let's see. And then you already go to the place where these uh, uh, interviews are stored. And this is the language archive at the Max Planck Institute. Okay. So if I would go back and uh, also use the download option here, um, it's not that you can immediately download um, these um, data. So it's, uh, you end up here at the same place. And then, for example, when we have a Bianca and go there, we go to her data, but you will see we have the, um, the, the audio files and the transcriptions of the interview, but it is restricted. So you really have to ask permission to, uh, I think, University of Siena uh, to be able to uh, access the material. But what we also have is here a clip and that's open. So you can have a snapshot of the interview to get an idea of what it is about, the quality of the audio and so on, to see if, if it's interesting to you. But also in the description here and in the metadata, there's a lot of information that helps you in finding out whether this is relevant for you or not. So if I um, would go back again and would here go back to Lydia, there's more metadata information even, which is much more uh, uh, detailed, but also has summaries of all the audio files that are in there. So it's much more extensive and this rich metadata helps also in deciding whether this material is useful for you. Okay, so much for the first example. Um, I should also say that uh, when it comes to oral history, um, you have a specific um, issue when it comes to um, the, the, the personal data uh, of mentioning names. So names are very personal. Uh, I think we agree about this. And that's exactly why you most of the time can't use the names because it's part of your anonymization, especially when we have talking about pathological speech, as we'll do right now. Uh, there should be no names of the persons in there. But for oral history, Typically, they want to be known, they want the names to be mentioned, right? Uh, and some of this means that you have to protect them against themselves because they are saying things in the interviews which are perhaps um, um, dangerous or uh, make others vulnerable and so on. So uh, it's a really special kind of personal data, I would say. Okay, so much about oral history. Now we turn to pathological speech, Polish deaf children, sensitive material, for which we do not know the names uh, and they are not shared at all. Um, but this is a, a legacy uh, data um, and um, um, it was collected, uh, I thought it was longer ago, but it is in the 90s it was collected at, a, at an institute um, um, and there are no consent forms for this. And it is shared. So I could talk longer about this, but for now, um, I will first tell you about how the data is shared because it is along the principles that I outlined um, for uh, the DELAT initiative and how the Knowledge Institute for Atypical Communication Expertise works. So this is the talk bank, more specifically the FOM bank. So it is the CMU. And here you can download the FOM data. It's not personal data, so you can do this and the chat data. Um, and, and there's all the, the, the metadata. But when you go to the collection itself with the audio files, you go back to the language archive um, uh, at the MPI in Nijmegen, where the raw data is stored and made available, you see. So if you would click these, you see that the audio again is restricted and the other stuff is open. So you have to apply to get access to the audio um, and then you can continue. Um, so these are the two um, use cases I wanted to present. Um, let me use one minute because perhaps this is a burning question to you and it's also relevant for what I've been talking about also in, in terms of the data protection impact assessment. I said we do not have um, the consent forms here. So we had a data impact assessment uh, for this, and we decided that we could share the data on this basis. And what were the reasons that we thought we were on the safe side? Well, 
And this is what we describe. And transparency is indeed relevant for when you share the data, especially when you share data for which we, you do not have consent forms. So the data is anonymous in the terms of we only have uh, a kind of code for all of the participants. It's not directly related to their names. What they are telling are word lists with no sensitive context. It's just a, a test effect. So this is what, they, what, what the audio files contain. It are children, um, and by now they have long passed uh, the date of being children. They are adults now, which means that the voices have changed a lot as well, as particularly of the boys. Um, so recognizing them from the voices is also very improbable. So we think we are at the stage where we can say it's, well, it's near anonymous and the uh, risk of a data breach is really, 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 really minimal. And then we say, okay, we consider them uh, outside of the GDPR, kind of anonymous, but we share them under a restricted access and to make transparent why we share them. Um, and so here you have a data protected impact assessment that was not ending in, a, um, in, in, in blocking distribution, but was ending in a surprising uh, way of being able to share them. So, I mean, the GDPR is not always your enemy. And with that, I would like to close. Thank you.